for this computer. Okay, so the question is, what is the difference between a narrative, a historical narrative, and a story? So what, what can you come up with ideas? Like, give me an example of a, the book in the Tanakh that starts off like a story. Wait, what's the question? The question is, how can you detect? If somebody's telling you a real narrative, a real historical, something about history, and how, if somebody's telling you a story, well, what's the difference? History is true. The story can, some parts of it can be made up. I understand. But uh, let's say, but how can you tell that I am telling you something historical? or I'm telling you a story, what would be the difference in the way I'd present it? It's from like your own perspective, if it's like a narrative. And that's not, but in my words, if you're gonna tell me a story, um, like for instance, if you're gonna tell me what happened to you yesterday, how would you say it? Yesterday, this, this, and this happened to me. Okay, and if you're going to tell me a story, theoretically about what could have happened yesterday, but may or may not have happened, how would you have said it? The same way. The same way? Like yes, Yeah, like yesterday, this, this, and maybe this happened. <laughs> I'm not talking about lying. I'm talking about telling a story. <laughs> a story is not a lie. When a, when a person writes fiction, they're not trying to lie. If it's like, if it's a narrative, you would maybe add in your own thoughts about it. Okay. Okay. Hmm. We have a book in the Tanakh, which the Talmud claims is a story. Do you know which book that is? Um, I read it from yeah. the Bible. In Baba Batra, I think it's 14. There is a book of the Tanakh that the Talmud seems to come to the conclusion that it is a metaphorical story, even though it seems to be written about somebody. It's very unusual. Here is Baba Batra. It's either 14 or 15. I can find it. No, it's a little bit further than that. <clears throat> It's a story, it's the book of Eov. Let me find it. There's a lot about Eov here. The question is when Eov lived. Some people say that Eov lived during the time of Moshe. Some people say, oh, here it is. It's on page 15, Babatra 15a. And it says, um, Trying to figure out, okay, um, Moshe Katab Sifro Parshad Bilam. The Eov, okay? The, the Talmud says that Moshe wrote the book of Eov. <clears throat> and there are those who say Eov be me Moshe Haya, et cetera. And they try to figure out exactly. And when, and it says also he was in the land of Uts and Eov Shmo. So obviously it must have been somebody, et cetera. And then finally, um, et cetera, and then Eov, uh, uh, then finally the Talmud says, Eov lo haya lo nivra, ela mashal haya. There's a, it's um, an opinion here that a Eov was basically a metaphor about the question of the problem of evil. There are those who say it's time, bimei shvota shoftim, um, there are those who say Eov during the time of Achashverosh. Um, and then finally, there are those who say he was a Jew. There are those who say he wasn't a Jew. Um, um, I'm trying to find the last. There's just so much here about Eov. 
But anyhow, Rambam claims that the dominant view is the one that Eov was a mashal. Meaning the Moshe Rabbeinu writes the book of Eov as a parable. Now, the question is, it's just hard. There's so much here on Eov. I'm sorry about that. It's a little hard for me to find it all one shot. It's easier, actually, if I just look it up in Wikipedia, then I'll give it to you exactly. I want to get the exact quote. Here, it says, Eov lo nivra, lo hayav lo nivra, el mashal, yeah. Exactly, here. here it is. Okay, so this is taken from Babatra, yeah, 15, 15A. I'm surprised I didn't see it. It's a little hard to see these things sometimes when there's so much. Basically, that's that's what it says. Lo hayav la nivra la mashalaya. Um, who is? But says without without a name. And the Rambam says that that's now. The, then of course the the Talmud says, "Well, wait a sec. If Eov is a metaphor, then why does it say Ish hayav eretz Uts that he lived in the land of Uts and his name was Eov? Do you need to know that?" Part of the story, right? So, when you say that Eov is a metaphor, you're not saying it's a lie. You're saying that Moshe Rabbeinu is trying to convey a message. But there are other opinions that Eov was actually a person. The only question is when he lived, but we don't know much about Eov because aside from the fact that it says he lived in the land of Uts, wherever that might have been, um, we... Um, we do, it's not not any nothing else historical is written about the book. Now you have also books that will start off by Hebe May. By Hebe May usually sounds more historical. By Hebe May Shvota Shoftim, by Ra'av Ba'aretz, the Book of Ruth, right during the time of the judges, and our Megillah, by Hebe May Achashverosh, it's giving actually historical time. Now, if you look at other um, books in the Tanakh, let's go even earlier, let's say the book of Shoftim. The, the term by here is actually very common. At the beginning of Yehoshua, by here, Hamot Moshe Ebed Hashem, by Yama Hashem al Yehoshua, by he, and the book of Shoftim, a little hard to get to the pages. Also, So this Vahi is very common. which is the beginning of the way Vahi Most of the books of the, of the Tanakh, which are narrative, have the word Vahi. Whereas in Eov, it starts Ishaya. <laughs> There's no Vahi, which already seems to be an indication where it's a metaphor. Now, in Megillat Esther, it starts by Hebe May. Okay, so it's telling a story and it gives us the name of the king and we know that there's a king of Hashverosh. So then, what about it seems metaphoric? Well, I'll give it an example. It's a little hard for me to show everything here. I will try. Um, sometimes in the Tanakh, oh, I need another, I need another, uh, um, sometimes in the Tanakh they are telling a story but they are the story itself has um, is not told in its exact way uh, I'll give you an example from uh, Sefer Shmot okay um, in Sefer Shmot Bat Paro goes down to the Nile and in the Nile, she sees this little baby who's floating in a little raft. And she wonders, and she says, this must be for one of the Hebrew children, because she knew that her father had decreed that all the males would be killed. And this was a male. So she takes it, and Miriam 
Moses' sister is sitting there and she says, should I find somebody for you <laughs> to, to wean the kid before you take him to the, the palace? She says, yeah, yeah, good idea. And then she goes, brings your heaven, whatever. And then when Moses is brought back to the palace, okay, she gives him a name and she calls him Moshe. He mean Hamayim Meshitihu. She calls him Moses because I took him out of the water. Moshe Limsho, which means to take out of Minamayim Mishitu. Remember that story? Now the question is, if Bat Paro was an Egyptian, now probably she would have given him an Egyptian name. So is Moshe an Egyptian name? And if it's an Egyptian name, what does it mean, Ki Min Hamayim Mishitu? Are you following? Since I can't see you, I can never know if you're following. Yeah, yeah, following. Yeah. So, uh, uh, in my opinion, I'm not the first to say this, uh, what's going on here is that she is giving him an Egyptian name, and probably his name was very, you know, was Mises. Mises. Why Mises? Because Mises means the son of an Egyptian. How do I know that? Because there's a city in Egypt called Ramses, the one that the Jews built. They built Pitom and Ramses. Ramses in Egyptian means the son of the god Ra. Ra was the sun god. Ram Meses. Ramses. And by the way, Paro himself was called Ramses. And many think that Ramses was the Paro of the, um, the Shemot story where we left Egypt. And that's why they built a city called Ramses in his honor, right? Pitom and Ramses. So wait, so what? Would, why would Moshe be called Meses? Moshe would be called Meses because he was drawn from the Nile, and the Nile is one of the gods of Egypt. So probably he meant he was called something like the son of, or the son of the Nile god, or something like that. Because in the royal family, especially in antiquity, a uh, royal member of the family is considered a, a, a gift of the gods because that's the whole mystique of royalty being more, being superhuman, whatever. So all names of royalty always had to do with the gods. And then probably Moses, because he was actually found on the Nile, she came up with this idea. He is the son of the Nile, but the Nile is one of the gods of the Egyptian pantheon. So that fits in very well. In Hebrew... They didn't want to use that name exactly for Moshe, right? The Torah gave him Moshe, which has its own meaning, which I'll get to in a moment. And Moshe means to be drawn from the water. So it's exactly the same meaning of the name which he probably got from Pharaoh. Because the Nile actually is part of the pantheon of the Egyptians. So then even though the Torah is presenting us a name which is sli probably slightly different in the etymology, uh, or at least in the, in the way of the style of the name that he got in Egyptian, it's close enough that we can understand what's going on. He was drawn from the Nile. He gets a name after the Nile. But in Hebrew, his name is Moshe. And Moshe, there's a lot of interesting stuff. By the way, Moshe in Gematria, a numerical value, is the God's name, El Shaddai. So <laughs> purposely they wanted Moshe and not something else about the Nile. Uh, but I'm just saying there's a lot where the Torah plays around, but the Torah can do that. <laughs> so, um, the Torah, I've always said, and I think this is also said by Professor Hare from Hebrew University, that, um, of course, he's talking about Hazal. I would say the Torah itself, the Torah itself is not interested in histi historiography. It's interested in historiosophy. Meaning it, it's not that um, important for it to relate every historical fact that was. It's not a history book. It's a book about the meaning of history. It's interested in meta-history. It's interested on God's perspective of history, history, if you want to put it that way. What's important in history? And not necessarily who's who. Who's who we can figure out by ourselves. There's archaeology. There are documents and papyruses. We can try to figure it out. The Torah is telling a true story. But if you want to know every detail, you got to break your head. Because it's not there to give you every detail. 
In fact, if the Torah was purposely trying to give you every detail, it would be a little suspicious. It's like the Quran, which is trying constantly every couple of pages, trying to convince you that it's a divine book because of this and that. It's hard to take that seriously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and this has to be true because I told the Jews of Israel, the people of Israel, so obviously, you know, it's true. That's what the Quran keeps defending itself all the time. So um, the Torah doesn't have to do that. I've always said the biggest proof that the Torah is an authentic book is because if it was an authentic book, it would try to prove itself all the time. But instead, what happens is Moses is constantly criticizing the Jewish people. Now, who would want to accept a book that's criticizing you unless you absolutely knew it was true? <laughs> so, so you want to get rid of books that criticize you. I don't want the ones that... that. <clears throat> so, um, so that's one example for Sefer Shemot. Another example is from the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, there are two children to Elimelech. And this, the book of Ruth, remember, is a story which is being told by Samuel the prophet, according to the Talmud and Baba Batra, about the lineage of King David. So obviously he wants all the lineage to be there, and it's presented at the end of the book. And he wants to present certain stories which are inspiring about the background of David and Melech, even though you would think it would be a slight a story you'd want to cover up him being from a Moabite woman, but no, Samuel has no problem with that issue. But what he does cover up in the book is the names of the two sons of Elimelech. Because the first son is called Machlom, and the second son is called Chilia, which is a very strange name for children. Machlon sounds like Machala, which is, of course, disease. Kilion, which means decimation and destruction. I mean, you really have to have a sense of humor to call your children something like that. So, um, what's exactly? And this is actually not me. This is the Midrash. The Midrash Rabbah on the Book of Ruth claims that Machlon and Kilion were not the real names of the children of Elimelech. It's basically a change of the narrative done by Samuel because of the fact that they left the land of Israel and went off to marry Moabites. <laughs> words, they shouldn't have ever left the land of Israel. So therefore, Shmuel and Navi is actually um, not happy with them and giving them these names. So where were the real names? I'll show you. Steve Rehayam. One. So it's Chronicles. One, chapter four. Chronicles one, chapter four. You find it quickly. I find chapter four, 17, it's four. That happened. Okay. Here it is, Machan Mamre. Sons of Judah. This is the chronology of the sons of Judah. Let's keep going down. The sons of Judah and the tribe of Judah. All the people from the tribe of Judah, because if you remember, Elimelech is from the tribe of Judah. And then you have Second, lost it. Sons of Chela, Zeret, and the sons of Peretz. Yabes, Chlu, Veshton. Um, it's hard, too hard in the English. Bene Kale, Ben Yafune, Ben Ezra, Ben Asian. Here it is, 21, verse 21. The children of Shela, the son of Yehuda. Here father of Lecha and Lada, and the father of Maresha. And then look at verse 22. And Yochim and the men of Kozeba, and Yoash and Saraf. Yoash, like there's a king whose name is Yoash. Saraf, which means an angel. Asher Ba'alu Moab. This is a very bad translation. Not that they had dominion in Moab. They married into Moab. Ba'alu, Ba'alim. They married Moabite women. 
Vyashuvi Lechem, terrible translation. They came back to Beit Lechem. Vyashuvi Lechem, they came back to Beit Lechem. And the Hadvarim Atikim, and it's an ancient story. So we have a, a mention here of the story of the Book of Ruth in Divrei Amim. There were two guys whose who name was Yoash and Saraf, who married Moabite women. And they returned, meaning the women, returned to Beit Lechem, and it's an old story. So their names, according to the Midrash, in Midrash Rabbah, were not Achlon and Chilion, but were Yoash and Saraf. So why did Shmuel and Navi change their names? Because he didn't like what they did. So he changed their names. Anybody who looked into the history at the time knew their names. And we knew right away that Shmuel and Navi had changed their names on purpose to make a point. You understand what's happening? So sometimes you have a change of narrative on purpose to make a statement. Are you still with me? So now let's go back to Ruth. The book of Ruth, excuse me, go back to Esther, I'm sorry. Let's go back to the book of Esther. Are we going to do that? Yes. We'll now take Chronicles. We'll go to Esther. One. So, here it is, Machan Mamre again. Now, the book of Esther is written by Hebe May, came to pass in the days of Hashverosh, who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 170, uh, 27 provinces. So, it's written like a historical document. <clears throat> oh. Who is a Hashverosh? And how do we try to figure out its historical document? What, how do we know it's a document or how do we know it's a story? So, understand that. Um, let me just close this for a second because it's hard for me to talk to the page. What's going on here is basically uh, like this. We have a historical document, but this historical document raises some questions whether the run writing the, the document, which according to our tradition is Esther and Mordechai, but was definitely edited by the Anshay Knesset Hagadola, according to the Talmud of Baba Batra, the men of the Great Assembly in the in the um, in the middle of the um, Second Temple period. So, um, <clears throat> is it just a historical document? Well, obviously not. It's telling a story. Was anything in the story changed or emphasized? Probably yes. Well, what was emphasized? Let's start from the beginning. Esther and Purim are words which are not Hebrew, right? What does Purim mean in uh, in Persian? What does Purim mean? Does anybody know? A lot. A lottery. Whoa, and how did you know that? <laughs> because it said, she knows that because she knows the Megillah. The Megillah uh, says, he peel pur hu hagoral asher lifnei uh, aman. He drew a lottery in Persian, which means goral in Hebrew, agrala before Haman. <laughs> so the Megillah itself says to the reader, assuming the reader doesn't know Persian. Now, why is the Megillah assuming the reader doesn't know Persian? Because I told you, Megillah is there according to the narrative, is written by Esther and Mordechai. But the the um, editing is taken is done under the Adshay Knesset Agdola which we don't know exactly when under Anshay Knesset Agdola, but we know in Pirkei Avot that the last member of Anshay Knesset Agdola was Shimon Atzadik. That's the first Mishnah of uh, Pirkei Avot. And he lives around 300 before the Common Era, maybe 350 before the Common Era. So by that time, there's no more Anshay Knesset Agdola. But now 350 before the Common Era, there still are Persians. But the Anshay Knesset Agdola are in the land of Israel. So they're starting to realize, hey, certain words people might not understand. So they write poor, which means goral in Hebrew. <clears throat> That's what I think. But whatever. The um, Oh, so you have poor means something which is a lottery. What does Esther mean? Like secret, like Sekar? No, no, in Persian. Oh, I have no idea. Yes, you do. What does it sound like in English? 
<laughs> there's there's an English word which is actually based on the word Esther. Twinkle, twinkle. Star? Yeah. The oh, word star I mean... is from the Persian word astar. Oh. Cool. Yes, astar. A star is a star. Now, why did the English language like, well, I think there's a cat who is stuck on my balcony because he was able to jump up all the way to my air conditioner. Now he can't get down. Poor thing. I have to work on that after. That's weird. It's like for an hour, it's been walking around on my balcony. Okay, so Esther is a star. A star. Why, why in the English language, an étoile, which is, of course, in French, an astral, an astrology, astrology is from the Persian astar. Because the Persians and Babylonians were the ones who were very interested in astrology and astronomy. And because of that, the Persian word became the popular word for people who are interested in the stars. So Esther means, of course, a star. It's also one of the gods of the Persian pantheon, the Babylonian pantheon, Ashtar, which becomes a female god and is the god of the stars because the stars control mankind. That's what astrologers thought in those days, and some of them even think that way today. So um, that's one thing. But um, so you have Esther, which means a star. And by the way, and you have um, Haman, which is a lottery accident. Now, there are two ways of understanding. Uh, uh, so the first thing I, I just want to talk about, though, the external. Both of these are Persian words. So both of these are taking place um, with a Persian influence meaning non-Jewish. Why non-Jewish? Because it's in the Galut. It's in the diaspora. So the name of the holiday has a Persian name, and the name of the book is also a Persian name. Now, another thing I want to put up, pull up, there are a lot of Persian influences in the book of Esther, a lot of words in Persian. There are also Babylonian words. Uh, I'll give you an example. The names of, um, we have 12 months, 12 Hebrew months. In the five books of the Torah, there are no names to the 12 book, uh, months. There's HaChodesh HaRishon, HaChodesh HaSheni. They don't have names. In Sefer Balachim, they have names. Tishrei is called Yerach HaItanim. Uh, there's another name, Bul. But that's it. We don't even know the other 12 names. There might be one other. Uh, the Hebrew names that were used in the first temple period. They've fallen into disuse. We don't use them anymore, so nobody remembers them. What do we do we remember? We remember the Babylonian names. Tishrei, Teshvan, Kisle, Teve. These are all Babylonian names. And they're, they're mentioned in the book of Esther and of course in the book of Daniel, also under the Babylonian exile. These are the first they're mentioned at this time period. The Talmud says, why do we use Babylonian names? <laughs> why do we use them for describing our months? The Talmud says not to forget the Babylonian exile. That's the reason why Tishrei is Tishrei, and Heshvan is Heshvan, and Kislev is Kislev. Now, another unusual thing about Megillat Esther is Mordechai and Esther. Now, we already mentioned that Esther has a Babylonian name, uh, excuse me, a Persian name. I'm mixing up because the Persians conquered the Babylonian e exile. That's why you have both influences happening, because the Persians just incorporated whatever culture was before. They were inclusive in that sense. Um, <clears throat> so, um, um, so we mentioned the names, Mordechai and Esther. The funny thing about Mordechai and Esther, it's not the type of name you expect. Now, Esther, of course, is her non-Jewish name. What is e Esther's Jewish name? Anybody? What's Esther's Jewish name? Hadassah. Hadassah. Esther, he, Hadassah. Yeah, it says specifically also in chapter two. So you have Esther, who is Hadassah. So her name was Hadassah. And they called her Esther. And uh, Mordechai, what was his Hebrew name? Uh, 
I don't know. Doesn't say. He must have had a Hebrew name, but it doesn't tell us. The fact that it told us about Esther, it's just trying to give an indication what it means to be a Jew in the Galut. You always have two names. You've got your Hebrew name, and you have the name that everybody else calls you because you're not living in a Jewish country. So, your name, they call you Robert, but your real name is Reuven. They call you Susan. In Hebrew, you're Shoshana, right? We're used to that. So, and we try to get names which are, you know, more bland. Um, like, for instance, there are not a lot of Jews who, you know, would call their daughter, let's say, Christina, because it seems a little bit out of place. But I, actually, I know a Christina who is Jewish in, in Romania, and I know a Chris, two Chris's who are Jewish in Romania. So you have things like that, too, I guess, under the influence of communism or something like that. But normally that doesn't happen. So that's why it's interesting that the, the heroes of the story, Mordechai and Esther, not only do they have Babylonian names, but the meaning of the Babylonian names are two Babylonian gods, as I mentioned before. Mordechai is Morduk, and Esther is Ashtar. So Ashtar both means a star, but it happens also to be one of the gods of the, um, of the Babylonian deity. So why is this? Now, it's not, there are those who say it's a parody. It depends what you mean. In my opinion, it's not exactly a parody, but there is a satire about a Jew outside of the land of Israel. This is the state of the Jews outside the land of Israel. We have no choice. We try to live among our communities, but we're always going to be influenced by the culture around us. Now, there are good elements in the culture around us, not a question, but we'll also be influenced by the religious and ideological thinking of the culture around us, whether we realize it or not. We could be living in Williamsburg, we could barely know English, okay? And we're still going to be influenced by the culture surrounding us, whether we realize it or not, by, just by osmosis. So those Hasidim who think that they're so insular that there's absolutely no connection between them and the outside world, they have no idea what they're talking about. They are doing things that they don't even realize they're doing, doing because of the culture that you live in. That's just the way human beings work. The Talmud says in Ketubot, Yisrael olam zara that the Jews living in the among the nations are worshiping idols in purity, which means it's not their fault that they're being influenced by certain ideas mm -hmm. that they don't even uh, realize. So that's just the way uh, things go. Um, I mean, there are lots of examples of this. You have a lot of Jews. Obviously, the more a Jew is involved in the traditionalism, the Torah and observance, the more they will realize some of these things, but the less they're involved in their Yiddishkeit, the less they're going to realize these things. Uh, we can even see with values and etc. Um, but I won't go into this because it's, it's quite um, involved to try to explain. But uh, I mean, the whole, we talk about the Judaic Christian values, but the Christian values are quite different than some of the Judaic values. Because Christianity was very defeatist. Um, it was very, it's a very passive religion, which does not believe in the use of force for anything. Now, that creates a sort of balagan. <laughs> so, because you have armies on the one side, all of Europe, etc. But on the other hand, you don't believe in uh, anything but defeatism, right? Christianity was the meat shall inherit the earth. But when they look at Israel, they assume that Israel has to follow that. They, if you, they figure, oh, we don't have to, we're just regular people. Okay, that's another discussion by itself. So, um, so what you have here is then Mordechai and Esther. Mordechai probably had a Hebrew name, Esther. Mordechai would have probably had to have, by the way, a name like this. Um, because he is an aristocrat, he's living in Shushan Abira, which is the, um, the king's city, 
So as an aristocrat, he probably was, he might've been even given a name in addition to whatever name he grew up with. So it was probably given to him, this name. So he had to follow it. And Esther probably was also given the name Esther. Possibly when she married Achashverosh. So, or by Mordechai before that in anticipation, because he didn't want anybody to know that she was Jewish. Um, if you might notice in Megillah to Esther, Mordechai is called Yehudi very often by the Megillah. Esther is never called Yehudia ever in the whole Megillah. She, it's this idea of keeping her incognito Jewish identity hidden the whole time in the Megillah because she is the queen. So she never called Esther a Yehudia. At one point, Ahasuerus knows that she is Jewish, but he never calls her the Jew, and the Megillah never calls her the Jew. So it was obviously, it was left between them, uh, something uh, something like that. So the Megillah of, of uh, uh, one other thing about the Persian uh, influence of the, of the book of Esther. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll try to make this short. One of the things is that the book itself is called after a woman. Now that's not unusual. Megillah of Ruth is also after a woman. But the difference is that according to our tradition, Esther wrote Megillah and Esther, whereas Samuel wrote Ruth. And he's writing Ruth because Ruth becomes the main character that they want to display in her chesed and how her character brings down to King David. That's why it's called Ruth, even though it could have been the story of David. But that's not the way he wanted to call it. But on the other hand, Megillah is there which is written during the Persian Empire, is written by a woman about a woman. We have another example of a book like this, which is not part of our Tanakh. It's called the Book of Judith. The Book of Judith was written in the Second Temple period. The Christians call it uh, the Apocrypha, the books that were outside the Tanakh. We just call every book outside the Tanakh outside Tanakh. But uh, it's called the Apocrypha. And uh, the book was actually... Uh, considered a holy book by the Catholic Church. It's in their Bible. It's also in the Orthodox Christian Bible. It's not in the Protestant Bible. The Book of Judith, the Book of Maccabees one, uh, the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Tuvia. These are all within the Vulgata, which is the early collection of the Church um, holy, holy Script, which we never consider these books holy. We just consider them interesting um, uh, historical documents. But in the book of Judith, which is written under the uh, Persian, um, the Persian uh, Empire too, you can also see a woman who seems passive at the beginning of the book. And then this general Holofernes comes to her running away from the battle. And just like Yael Hakeni in the book of Judges, she seduces him and kills him for the Jews. <laughs> That's what Judith does. Now, this uh, in the Persians, by the way, were very big believers in the feminine mystique, what we sometimes call the femme fatale, that you have the woman, the power of women. And so the whole narrative of the book of Esther is a narrative which could easily take place under the Persian Empire because that was part of the culture, that women have that unspoken strength that if necessary watch out <laughs> so i'll give you an example there is a jewish historian his name is josephus flavius who lives in the first century he wrote two well three not well-known books one of them was called the war against the jews meaning the roman war against the jews or the jews against rome and then which is about the korban abite then he has another book called the antiquities and another one called Contra Pyomen. In the Antiquities, he tells a very strange story of how um, it was that Zerubbabel was elected to be the Jew who would leave the Jewish people back to Israel. And in the Bayit Sheni, how did this happen according to Josephus? So we're talking about Koresh, Cyrus I, the king of Persia, who takes over wins over the Babylonian Empire and is the beginning of the Persian Empire. 
And uh, Cyrus in Ezra chapter one, here it is right here. The first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. You can't see that, right? Sorry, we do share screen. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, Kordesh, the king of Persia, and he made a proclamation saying, this is what Cyrus, the king of Persia says, all the kingdoms of earth um, I was given by God of the heaven. And he told me, he, he commanded me to build his house in Jerusalem, which is in Ju Judah. So anybody among you, among his people, want to go up to Jerusalem in Yehuda and build the Beit HaMikdash, the house of God of Israel, that's the God in Jerusalem. In other words, he gives his proclamation to it. So Josephus says, how is Zerubbabel picked to lead the group? Because the Jews did go. And we know under the book of Ezra who the Jews were. And Daniel, uh, Ezra. So, um, so Josephus tells a very unusual story, which I don't know if it's told anywhere else. The king was having a party, Cyrus, and Zubavel was among was among the other aristocrats who were Zubavel, of course, was a Jew. Mm -hmm. um, among other aristocrats who were sitting there, and for the party, he wanted to have a game, and he said to them, "Can anybody come up with what is the most powerful thing in the world?" So one guy comes up with the idea that money is the most powerful thing. I think Americans. Normally agree with that, especially the American politicians. Then there are other people who talk about armies are the most powerful thing. And then Zerubbabel was asked his opinion, what is the most powerful thing? Zerubbabel said, obviously women. <laughs> and everybody was a little bit surprised. And Zerubbabel turns to Cyrus, to Koresh, he says, what do you mean? King Koresh, you are the greatest king on this planet. You have the mightiest empire, the mightiest army. And where did you come from? if not the womb of a woman. So obviously a woman must be the strongest power on this earth. Okay. And then of course, Cyrus, Cyrus thought that was a wonderful argument. And he said to Shubavel, how could I help you? Shubavel says, well, you know, my people are sitting in sackcloth. We don't have our temple. We don't have our Jerusalem. And then Cyrus makes this famous proclamation. It's according to Josephus Flavius in his antiquities. But this is the same idea. The Persians had this belief in the feminine mystique, and therefore it's not for no reason that the book is called Esther and not Mordechai. Even though, even though, um, in, um, in the book of Maccabees, the book of Esther is called the story of Mordechai, because the Greeks didn't think the same way the Persians did. And they're probably wondering why you use a woman's name to have a book. So in the book of Maccabees, uh, Maccabees 2, it's referred to as the book of Mordecai. But under the Persians, no, it made a lot of sense to call it the book of Esther. Because Esther starts off as this very passive woman, doesn't know what's going on. She's taken to the palace. It's not her fault. She doesn't want anything, whatever. And when Mordecai in chapter 4 tells her Esther, this is your chance to do something and don't think you will be saved in the palace <laughs> if you try to cop out. And then Esther transforms into this femme fatale, manipulating a chashverosh and manipulating Haman and bringing Haman down and hanging the sons of Haman and uh, making sure the Jews have a second day to kill their enemies. I mean, whoa, where did that happen from? So this narrative is a narrative which fits perfectly into the culture of the Persian society. So 100%, the book of Esther is written under the Persian Empire. Not even a question. And the, the multitude of words that we have in Persian, achashranim and pachot, achashranim, achashranim, you have the word satrap, satrap, which is a Persian word for governor. <clears throat> so, um, and pachot fecha, which is also a Persian word, for a smaller governor. And, um, but there's so many words. Vashti. There's a, a book written by a woman whose name is, I have to finish this almost one, uh, whose name is, um, oh, what is her name? What is her name? 
it skips me for a moment. Um, she wrote a book about the Persian words and the Megillat Esther. And um, there's lots and lots of Persian words in Megillat Esther, 50, 60 Persian words, in addition to the word Purim. And she says that once you understand the words, you also sense some of the narrative better. Like Vashti in, in Persian means the best. <laughs> Was that her actual name? Well, if if um, if uh, Hashverosh is Xerxes the first, well, we know his wife's name. It does sound a little bit like Vashti, but it's it is a different name. And um, but Vashti means the best. And when he decides to replace Vashti, it says Mumuchan says to her, "Okay, the advisor." We'll find a girl who's better than her. Tova mimena. So it becomes a play on words. The best, but there's somebody who's better than the best. Haman means hamachshava tova, which means the good thinking, the good thought, which is one of the names of the Zeroastrian pantheon. The Persians didn't believe in the Babylonian gods. They believed in Zeroastrism, which had its own gods. And one of them was called the good thought, which was Haman's name. So now you understand why Mordechai didn't want to bow down to Haman. It wasn't only what Chazal say that he put maybe a figure of a, of a god around his neck. His name itself <laughs> was, that, that was the type of person that he was, uh, I guess. So in fact, according to this lady, um, um, all of the seven Roi Pnei HaMelech in chapter one, all their Persian names, all the, the first six um, represent six of the deities of the gods of Zeroastrianism, and the last one was means an eagle. So I'm going to end off by saying this, because there's there's really a lot uh, to say here. When is Megillah Esther written? Well, since Cyrus is the first Persian king and it's written under the Persians 100%, <laughs> that means it's written in the Galut, but not only in the Galut, it's written in the Galut after the Jews are allowed to go back to the land of Israel. So these were Jews who decided not to go. Um, and the whatever the narrative was originally, I mean, Gilad Root, because we don't know how much editing was done by the Antichrist of Hamidullah, there seems to be a lot and Migilat Root, uh, Migilat Esther, I keep, I'm sorry, I keep saying Root because I mentioned of you done. There's a lot in Esther, which is trying to, I would say, warn Jews what it means to be in the Galut. Now remember, the Babylonian exile is only 70 years. We've been in Galut for 2,000 years. We know all about it. But for Jews who have only been 70 years, sometimes they don't realize what's happening. To be in Galut means to be in a whole different world. You're living under the poor the lottery, things by accident. The whole Haman is all about the world is by accident. There is no real God in the world. That's Haman. He pretends to be a Zoroaster, whatever, but his whole attitude to life is that it's all by accident. Let's just run lotteries and let nature take its course. Whereas the most obvious thing, of course, in Megillatis there is that God's name is not mentioned. And I'm sure you've heard this from other teachers. The fact, there are, there are two books in the Tanakh where God's name is not mentioned. One of them is Shir Shirim, but that's a poem. And the other one is Esther. Esther, 100% it's on purpose. Because even when Mordechai wants to say God's name, he's not allowed to. When he says to, in chapter 4, he says to Esther, and if you're going to hide in the king's palace at this moment, Salvation shall come to the Jews from another place. Yeah, what's the other place? <laughs> what's another place? <laughs> Why not say God? He can't. It's not allowed to in the narrative. It's obviously that way on purpose. But the name of the Megillah in Hebrew is Megillat Esther, which if you look at the Hebrew words, Megillah for the word Legalot, which means to reveal, and Esther from the word Slater, which you mentioned earlier in Hebrew, Nistar, is hidden. So the whole book of it is about revealing the, the what's hidden. What is hidden in Megillah Tester? The name of God. So the Jew in the Galut has to look for the hidden, has to look for God's name in the Galut because it's hidden, but it's still there. 
So if you look, you have to make work a little bit harder, but you can find God in any place. And in the Galut, you have to work hard to find God behind the scenes. But he's still watching the Jews. So you have Megillah. So the, the importance of the Megillah is it's talking about Jewish survival in the Galut. And it's talking using the Babylonian exile as the first paradigm because it's the first paradigm of Galut. But by the time it's finished editing, and Esther was probably the last book to be argued about in the Tanakh, and there are Tanakhs finished around 300 before the Common Era, um, as a canonized, what I mean, but and the books were well known by that time, but there were still arguments about Megillah and Esther well until the end of by Cheney. You can look at Megillah Duff Zion and see the arguments between Rav and Shmuel, who are even later than that, about Megillah and Esther. But um, the argument is exactly, you know, the importance of the document. But after the destruction of the mm-hmm. temple, it becomes even more obvious why Megillah Esther is an important educational um, story to understand that to teach Jews that God is watching us in, in the in the Gola in the exile. So what was I trying uh, to say from, uh, from all this? It's um, that Megillat is there, and I don't have time because I said I would cut it short, is a historical document. Achashverosh, according to the Septuagint, Achashverosh was Atar Xerxes, but most people think he was Xerxes the first, who is the son of Darius the first. That's approximately... 580 for the common era, 480, excuse me, 480, after the Jews have already started to go back to the land of Judea. And this is the Jewish community still living in the Gola, who hasn't decided yet whether they want to come to Israel or not. Eventually they will, but not at, at this point. And um, possibly the fact what happens with Haman is a catalyst which brings them. Who says this? This brings us back to Hasidism, the Rebbe of Gur. The Rebbe of Gur, who was a contemporary of um, Menachem Mendel of Kotzk, we talked about. So the grandson writes his book, Sfat Emet. In Sfat Emet, he says, it would seem to me, he's writing this in the 1880s, that the miracle of Purim was to prepare us for the Second Temple. Because Israel needed strength in order to come back to the land of Israel. And because of this miracle, this miracle in the Galut, it made us proud again to be Jews, and that helped us come back to the land and build up the temple. And then he adds, and it's very possible that at some future time, there will be another nace, there'll be another um, miracle, which will happen before the Geula, before the um, final redemption, as Chazal say, and this is a very thing, strange thing, because it doesn't sound like a miracle, as Chazal say, that he's going to bring a king who will be as bad as Haman, <laughs> and, uh, and they will do tshuva. And whatever is going to happen that, then that miracle is going to bring to the final redemption. Well, if they're talking about Haman, we had quite a few Hamans of the 20th century, especially with the Shoah. But then, of course, the response of the Jewish people was the land of Israel and the state. So it's interesting that he writes this in the 1880s. And uh, well, well, well before the, the state of Israel. So Megillah Tester then becomes this very, very important document. It has mixtures of storytelling in it in order to emphasize things. But it is based on uh, a history that we know to a certain degree. There are a lot of things we don't know about the Persian Empire. But uh, we can more or less pinpoint it to either Xerxes or anti-Xerxes. And um, a lot more has to be looked into into this. So that are by everybody. I hope this was okay. I will stop the recording.